Hola, salam alaikum. That's the extent of my foreign language capacity. So I'll deliver this in English. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, but circumstances make it impossible. The panel is the war on terror, and my question is, does propaganda work? Is it effective? So I'll put that in the context of the war on terror. I'll mostly stick to the UK and also the US because I know those countries better than any others. And um, as a comparative analysis, I'll talk about humanitarian intervention as well. So the population of the UK tends to oppose war unless it is mobilized and galvanized. And the two traditional ways of getting the public to support war are to scare them by uh, telling them that a war is necessary for self-defense. So we can give as an example the invasion of Iraq in 2003, uh, where we were told that we had to defend ourselves against Saddam Hussein and his non-existent weapons of mass destruction. And another way of mobilizing support for war is to appeal to people's humanity, to um, selectively uh, show the atrocities of one organization, say the self-professed Islamic State, Daesh, uh, and uh, to ignore, say, what's happening right next door in Saudi Arabia, similar style uh, state behavior, beheadings and so on. Uh, so atrocity propaganda and self-defense. Uh, those are the two traditional ways so what about uh, Afghanistan, which was the major uh, war waged with the um, uh, in the name of the war on terror? This was uh, October 2001. Uh, well, the British and Americans were told that we were waging a defensive war and also to uh, support the war on terror, the global war on terror. Um, the aim was to track down the person supposedly ultimately responsible for the 9-11 attacks, Osama bin Laden, and to remove the Taliban government which had supposedly sponsored him. That's what the public was told. So it was a twin propaganda effort of uh, a global war on terror but also humanitarian intervention because the Taliban was such a despicable regime. The Institute for Democracy and Conflict Resolution said that after 9-11, about 65% of British people were willing to send troops to Afghanistan uh, to find the alleged suspect, Osama bin Laden, and to oust his sponsors, the Taliban. An Ipsos Mori poll found that nearly 70% uh, supported the bombing of Afghanistan. However, of uh, four out of the five polls which actually uh, asked about civilian casualties uh, revealed that majorities to pluralities of British people opposed the bombing if civilians were going to be hurt. So one successful method of propaganda is to simply omit from media coverage and even when taking polls uh, any concern for uh, civilians who are going to be caught up in bombing. And 82% um, of Americans, uh, when they were asked by Gallup, the polling agency, said that uh, bombing should only be undertaken after the identity of the perpetrators had been clearly established. Well, a year after uh, the FBI still said that we have no clear proof that bin Laden was responsible. Uh, but most Americans assumed that bin Laden was responsible, so most supported the bombing. Uh, in the UK, a YouGov poll found that 60% of British respondents opposed uh, 
massive airstrikes, carpet bombing, which is what actually happened. So although people tended to support the war, when they were asked about specifics, such as should we identify the perpetrators first, should we uh, carpet bomb, uh, many said no. Uh, so propaganda is only effective when certain conditions are met, like the ones I mentioned. Well, as the war occupation dragged on, uh, support declined. So by 2009, that's eight years into the occupation, only 22% of British people uh, approved of the uh, approved of British involvement. So turning to uh, Iraq, there were three rhetorical pretexts for invading in 2003. Uh, the first was that the uh, dictator Saddam Hussein posed an imminent threat to the world. Uh, there were claims that he could launch weapons of mass destruction within 45 minutes, all of it fabrication. Uh, the second was that Iraq, invading Iraq, was part of the war on terror because Saddam Hussein was briefly connected to Osama bin Laden, the alleged perpetrator of 9-11, by the Bush administration in the US, which led the invasion. That again was a fabrication. So Iraq was partly uh, included in the so-called war on terror. And the third main justification was again humanitarian intervention because Saddam Hussein was such a terrible dictator. So there uh, three reasons were brought forward. So what did Americans think? Uh, Chicago Council on Foreign Relations poll taken in June 2002, so that's before the invasion, found that only 20% of Americans agreed that the US should invade Iraq without UN approval. By January 2003, so getting closer to the invasion, 68% uh, of Americans, according to PIPA, the program on uh, international policy attitudes, they wrongly believed that Iraq was linked to 9-11. So that's nearly 7 in 10 Americans believe that Iraq was connected to 9-11. Uh, the same organization found that overwhelming majorities also believed that Iraq possessed weapons of mass destruction. So by the time of the invasion, and this is March 2003, a majority of Americans appeared to support the bombing, uh, but it's not clear whether they understood that the UN had not approved. Uh, so in the UK, in January 2003, a couple of months before the invasion, an Ipsos Mori poll found that only 15, one five, 15 percent of Britons supported the US-British invasion without UN approval. Uh, and that's what happened. It was a blatant act of aggression, blatant war crime. Uh, but the media in the UK and in the US tried to portray it as controversial. Some said it was axiomatically right. Others said that, that uh, there's a question mark over it. So probably the majority of Britons and Americans thought that the UN had approved. Well, in the run-up to the invasion, an ICM poll put support among Britons at just 38%. Uh, but uh, Ipsos Mori points out that this probably reflects a difference in the, the way that the poll was worded, the questioning. Uh, it asked simply if respondents uh, disapprove or approve of military action to remove Saddam. Uh, but as I said before, when you factor into a poll or media coverage the fact that civilians are going to get hurt and that the UN does not approve, then support declines. Uh, so uh, Ipsos Mori found that by the 2nd of March, 67% uh, were opposed, but as the invasion neared 16th of March, uh, support had increased by about 
Um, so that's uh, uh, six, that would mean 63% opposed the invasion. Uh, so there were only uh, at its peak, uh, according to this poll, 26% supporting the invasion unconditionally. But as with the case of uh, Afghanistan, the longer the occupation continued, the, the more um, th there was a decline in support. So by May 2007, 77% of British people, uh, as they put it, disapproved of uh, Tony Blair's handling of the occupation. So turning to Libya, 2011, uh, here the war on terror is inverted. Uh, the United States, France and the UK used jihadis, uh, including, the, I mean, Al-Qaeda is a vague term, it's essentially a propaganda term in itself, but including uh, so-called Al-Qaeda elements in order to depose Muammar Gaddafi. That's not controversial anymore. Uh, but the public wasn't told this. And the bombing of Libya was portrayed as a humanitarian intervention. So here we have the twin propaganda of an inversion of the war on terror and also uh, the standard humanitarian intervention line that Gaddafi was a dictator and so on. Uh, well, in the US, um, a post-invasion poll uh, found that... Um, 47% of Americans approved of the U.S. bombing, uh, but Gallup, who, the polling agency, said that the poll did not ask Americans specific reasons for approving or disapproving, uh, or disapproving of the uh, efforts against Libya. And uh, Americans or British were not told that the bombing was unlawful under Resolution 1973, uh, which certainly, uh, even if you were to twist it, uh, does not authorize NATO bombing. So by the end of March 2011, this is uh, in well into the bombing, uh, Gallup reported that despite uh, majority or plurality supporting the bombing, uh, only 39% thought that the U.S. should take a lead role. 58% thought that the U.S. should either withdraw or play a minor role. Now, recall earlier I said that even fewer people supported the bombing of Afghanistan and Iraq if the U.N. did not approve. Uh, and here we find that um, Americans wanted the U.S. to play a minor role. So this indicates that uh, states engaging in war have to be seen to be either doing it with legal approval or as part of a coalition to somehow lessen the responsibility of their own state. That's another crucial element of wartime propaganda. Uh, well, in the UK, the uh, polls really show just how confused the public were with the, the bombing and the whole political situation. So by April 2011, uh, Reuters Ipsos Mori poll found that 63% supported the removal of Gaddafi, uh, but 50% supported the bombing. Uh, but in addition, 51% thought that we should not interfere. Well, you can't have 101%. Uh, so that meant that some of the people who said we should not interfere uh, also believed that um, we should help remove Gaddafi, which really shows just how confused the public were with, with the way it was being portrayed. And in the same month, another Ipsos Mori poll found that 40% were satisfied with the way that the government were handling it, compared to 40% who did not, so that was roughly split. Um, Interestingly, only 4% of British people uh, thought that Libyans actually supported their leader, Muammar Gaddafi, uh, when in fact we, we don't have extensive evidence, but the polling data that do exist uh, 
suggests that um, Libyans certainly did not want, the majority did not want Gaddafi overthrown. They wanted uh, democratic reforms, but not a, an overthrow. So the fact that only 4% of British people thought that Gaddafi was uh, popular among Libyans shows just how effective the propaganda was in demonizing Gaddafi and turning him into a universally hated uh, cartoon villain. So turning to Syria, it's a similar situation with Libya in that uh, jihadis were used as proxies by the West to depose Assad, or at least try to. And this is an inversion of the war on terror again. This time we're not supposedly going after terrorists, we're using them. And again, humanitarian intervention is invoked. So, uh, according to Britain's YouGov, uh, surveys have shown consistent support for humanitarian aid to Syria's uh, war victims, the, the civilian, the public, but opposition to any form of military involvement. This is going back to 2013. So again, we have a consistent theme of opposition to war, particularly when certain conditions are met. Uh, in the USA, 51% um, to 36 opposed Obama's bombing. Uh, most Americans even opposed arming the anti-Assad uh, jihadis, terrorists, uh, even those who said they had been following it closely on the news. So what about uh, Iraq uh, with the rise of Daesh, so-called Islamic State, uh, and the how that fits into the war on terror? Uh, well, in 2014, uh, the British and Americans had endured much uh, anti-ISIS atrocity propaganda uh, through the media and uh, finally supported uh, bombing ISIS. So by August 2014, 37% approved of bombing compared to 36% who disapproved. So very tiny majority approved. Um, however, when the journalist James Foley was beheaded, then approval for the bombing rose above 40% among the British. And um, by September 2014, the support had gone to nearly 60%, 57%. And uh, same story in the United States, the polls suggested that about 60% supported bombing ISIS. And of course, uh, ISIS spread to Syria. So in 2015, Britain started bombing Syria. Uh, data are limited for the United States. Uh, but by November 2015, uh, nearly six out of ten Britons approved of bombing Daesh in Syria, uh, specifically part as a coalition. So again, this gets back to the need on the part of um, war planners to somehow portray the war as being a, an international uh, effort rather than a unilateral effort. Uh, but again, as I mentioned earlier with Iraq and Afghanistan, as war, uh, as it's prolonged, support declines. So by December, the support was down to 44%. Uh, there's um, there's no broad answer to my question, uh, is propaganda effective? Does it work? Uh, it, its effectiveness, at least as far as the war on terror and humanitarian intervention is concerned, uh, that's contingent on a number of factors. Uh, so based on the evidence that I've presented here, uh, in terms of the war on terror, propaganda uh, in support of invasion and bombing uh, is effective uh, if the following conditions can be met. 
uh, at least three. Uh, number one, the military actions occur shortly after a major terrorist atrocity, so a knee-jerk reaction. Uh, number two, the public is kept ignorant of the facts that there will be civilian casualties. Uh, and three, the action has to be undertaken as part of a broader effort. So it's a question of dilution of uh, state, individual state responsibility. Uh, in the context of self-defense, as we saw with the Iraq example, uh, propaganda was not effective in the UK. Support never rose above 38% since 2003, uh, but it was in the United States. And again, several conditions were met. So military action was supposedly part of a broader uh, counter-terrorism strategy. Um, the action was self-defensive against these non-existent weapons of mass destruction. Military action was humanitarian, so uh, removing a dictator and not telling the public that you're going to destroy civilians. And um, the erroneous assumption that this was part of a, a broader international effort. So uh, to conclude, the effectiveness of propaganda uh, is uh, contingent on multiple factors and it can vary across countries. Thanks.